just give you a very brief background on what it is so that we can then talk about field diagnosis and then control. It is in, in cattle, it's caused by brucella abortus, and that's what I'm going to focus on today. And it also may cause abortion, infertility, decreased milk production. Um, a lot of people uh, say, well, we're not seeing any abortions, so it can't be brucellosis. Uh, wrong. Uh, we'll talk about clinical signs here in just a little bit, but that's kind of the hallmark sign uh, of brucellosis, especially if newly introduced into a herd. Um, there are actually a number of brucella species out there, and, and uh, they, they affect, it's a primarily host-specific, um, although it can cross over into other species with enough, enough of a dose, although many of these other species will be end, um, dead-end hosts. So, but as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to focus on brucella abortus. The thing I think is important, though, is if you look at those red stars, um, a number of these brucellas are human pathogens. And even though we um, I, uh, work on brucellosis, obviously, in animals a lot, um, and I do work, that's what I actually was doing in Armenia and some of the other countries that I work in, we're brought in not so much, though, because of the problems it causes in animals, but because of the impacts it has on human populations as a result, um, because it's definitely a zoonotic. And um, I can't tell you the number of times I've sat out someplace working with the veterinarian and actually had people coming in, sweating and saying, just, you know, test me, see if I've got it. Um, we're veterinarians, we don't test people in our country, but I kept my mouth shut and watched and they'll run the rose bangle in the car test and man, if those things were people, I mean, if those people were cows, they'd have been, you know. So that's, I always keep my mouth shut about that, okay? But the reality is this is a very serious disease in people and it impacts people all over the world. So that's why we, we spend a lot of time working in this, um, besides the obvious economic impacts it has on, on animals as well. Um, the, the brucella is a, a gram-negative facultative coxoid rod. It's the biggest, one of the big problems with it, though, is that it's intracellular. So it's, once it's in an animal, it's very hard to get back out of an animal. Um, so that's one of the difficulties in trying to deal with this disease in, in an impacted animal and also in a human. The good thing about brucella here um, is that it, it, the survival of it in the environment is related to temperature and moisture. So in a, in a hot environment, uh, when it's exposed to UV light, it actually only lives about four hours. So if you've got it out on the pasture somewhere, yes, it is a pasture contaminant. We'll talk about how it gets from cow to cow here in just a minute. But it's not going to live for days and days and days out on the pasture. Um, difficult, a uh, different situation in Armenia where I just left, where we had lots of snow and lots of brucellosis. Um, uh, that's a, an entirely different management aspect. So, um, but keep in mind, direct sunlight kills it very quickly. There are a lot of things that you still need to do to get it out of a population in an environment like this because it will survive in the animal and easily get transmitted animal to animal. Um, if it's in a cold, freezing environment, then the, the brucella can live a very, very long time. Um, less than 30 days usually under most environmental conditions, so we do recommend um, in, in areas that have colder or wetter areas that if we've gotten rid of it in a herd that we keep animals off that pasture for up to 30 days just to let the UV light go ahead and continue killing it. But what it really does in cattle is it causes um, a lot of economic losses, decreased milk production. Uh, there's one study that showed it caused up to 20 percent reduction in milk production uh, which is, if you're in the dairy business, that's a huge hit economically. And it's put a lot of dairies out of business just because of that. That between that and the, the replacement losses. It does cause also abortion losses, especially in newly affected herds. Um, and then, of course, the big losses in culling and replacement uh, losses when you're trying to do the test and slaughter program, which everybody normally hears about. If you just continue to test and slaughter and do nothing else, um, your numbers of animals in many cases will continue to decrease significantly if you don't do some of the additional things that you can do to get this disease out of the herd. I was actually in, in a country I won't name recently, but um, they were telling me about a dairy herd. Somebody had bought some very expensive dairy animals. They bought a thousand of them a couple of years ago, and now they're down to 200 um, just from culling uh, and, and testing for brucellosis without putting in place the other things that you need to do to get the disease out of the, out of the herd. So let's just talk a little bit about the epidemiology and pathogenesis of it. Um, where, where is it? How does it actually work? And so I looked at, in request to your 
trying to focus this on the Caribbean area. I looked at the OIE and I was glad to see other people referencing the OIE um, data here because it's very valuable data when you're trying to understand what's going on in the country. The other piece of that is very important, especially for you CBOs, that it's very important to, re to report. Um, because you, you can only respond to, uh, the, the only good data is good data. Um, but um, if you look at Brucella abortus distributions for the first half of last year, uh, you can see in the Caribbean area, um, the pink says clinical disease. Um, so there have been some reports, at least in this area. Just to throw out their Brucella melatensis, which is in sheep and goats, um, it's not re been reported in this area. And Brucella suis, which is in swine, also has not been reported generally in this area. You'll notice the United States is a big pink when it comes to Brucella suis. We do not have it in our domestic populations, but we do have it in our wild swine, our feral swine. So um, we have to be very careful to keep a barrier between feral swine and domestic swine to make sure that there's no spillover there. So let's just talk about susceptibility. And this is really important because when you're managing a disease, um, especially like brucellosis that impacts different animals differently, if you, folk, if you understand your susceptibility, then you can focus your efforts on those risk animals and you don't have to spend so much time working with the ones that are not high risk animals. So biggest point, heifers and pregnant animals are the most susceptible animals out there. If you don't write anything else down or remember anything else, please remember this because we have to manage these animals very carefully to ensure that they don't continue to spread the disease out there. Older animals are relatively more resistant. Operative word here is relatively. They can all get infected, um, but when you compare it to heifers or pregnant animals, your older animals are not nearly as susceptible. So if you have a decision, just as an example on how you use this, let's say you know you have an, uh, a heavily infected farm, and right next door to it, you have the option of putting either a herd of pregnant heifers or a herd of old cows. Who are you going to put next to that infected farm? The old cows. Right, okay? Simple thing where you're looking at how a farm is laid out, you've got to move some animals around, put your old ones next to your, next to your risk area, not these pregnant heifers, because they just look at it across the room and they're going to get it, okay? <laughs> They have increased resistance with vaccination. Again, operative word, increased resistance does, does not say immunity. They can still become infected if they're vaccinated. The vaccine is not perfect and it can get overridden with enough infection in the area. So think of these heifers when you're trying to manage it. First things you need to do is pay attention to those babies because they're going to bring it and they're going to keep it in that herd. So, and when we talk about management, and I love that conversation earlier. It was Cedric, I think, that's, that said that man word right there makes all the difference in the world. Now, I'm going to get in trouble. We had women out there doing this. Bam, it'd be gone like that, okay? <laughs> but no, it's, it's, it really is important in management to, to pay attention to who your risk animals are. So how do they get infected? They get infected by, and, and this is one of the, I asked this last night, with the Trinidad, Tr Trinidad group that we talked with. I always sit down when we're talking about getting rid of disease and say, how do they get it? Because every country I work in, well, we test and slaughter and we've been doing it for years and we still have infected, infection. Well, how do they get it? Okay? They get it at calving or abortion, an effective abortion or an effective calving. They ingest that bacteria. So that's where you need to stop the transmission during that time. That's your most common area. I'm speaking simplistically here because there are exceptions to every, everything I tell you, there's going to be an exception to it. But generally, if you pay attention to the time when they're calving and the time when they're aborting, that's the time you're going to break that transmission and get rid of this disease. So if you're doing your testing and you're doing it after they calved, what's the problem with that? Any, but easy question. They've already infected the other ones. Thank you. Exactly. So you come back six months later and you test them and you say, well, we got rid of all our positives six months ago. Why do we have 15 more? It's because those positives calved before you tested them, so the other ones tested negative, and now they're starting to show up positive. And it will go on forever until you do something to break that cycle. I like pictures. I remember pictures better than a lot of words. So everybody look at this picture. Remember it. This is brucella transmission occurring. Okay? This is an infected abortion, this is a late-term abortion, they usually, they usually are going to abort their last trimester. 
So we are worried about who aborted that, ca that calf, right? We want to get her gone. But if we get her gone and say, okay, our positive's gone, let's all go home, these are really the animals I'm interested in now. And so if we don't pay attention to these animals and know what they're doing, they're sniffing it, they're licking it, they're ingesting that bacteria, they are getting themselves infected right here as we look at this picture. So anytime you see this out there, if you see something that looks like that on the ground, and you see animals sniffing and licking, you better be paying real close attention to these animals. Now, how am I going to manage? They may have all tested negative today, tomorrow, next week, but how are you going to manage these animals? Because these are the ones that are going to continue that infection in the community. So, progression of infection, what happens? Okay, I'm going back to my pictures again, all right? So we got a cow. She's standing out in a pasture. She's one of these ones that just licked that one that we just saw earlier. So what happens now is the bacteria gets ingested, okay? She's licked it, sniffed it, whatever, and got it ingested. It goes through an incubation period where it replicates in the, in the lymph nodes of, this, of the suprapharyngeal area. And then there's a brief, um, uh, a brief time when the bacteria is in the blood. And it goes very quickly, about 10 days or so, and it goes through the body and basically seeds it down. That's a difference between humans. In humans, they tend to have a bacteremia for a longer period of time. So a lot of times people are infected, they'll actually try and culture the blood and do so successfully. Culturing blood in cows doesn't work very well unless you happen to get it during that 10-day cycle, and you probably will not. But after that 10 days then, it then goes and replicates in the lymph nodes, uh, the uterus of the cow, and it loves to live in there. Remember, it's intracellular. And between um, pregnancies, it lives in the uterus. I mean, I'm sorry, in the, in the lymph nodes in this area, it lives in the udder. And then when she gets pregnant again, it all starts to replicate again into that uterus and creates this beautiful bacteria uh, nursery so that when she calves again the next time, bam, she's seeded down the whole area. So she's not terribly infective between calvings. But even if she aborts the first time, when she gets pregnant again and calves again, she is heavily contaminating that area and others. She may look fine. She may have a normal calf. But she can still contaminate the whole area. So then she gets the, rid of it then by when she calves or aborts or drips fluids after she calves and aborts. All of these fluids that drip for a couple of days or weeks or up to 30 days, very infectious. So if you've got these curious heifers coming along or a bull that goes along and sniffs that back end of her, um, or you're in a milking parlor and she swats her tail with those fluids right across your face, um, not a good thing. So um, then also she passes the bacteria through her milk. So pasteurization of milk is really, really important uh, if we're going to be ingesting it. So an infective dose, and I've talked about dose, um, this is a dose-related uh, infection. So the more bacteria they're exposed to, the more likely they are to get infected. Okay? So what happens then is we have to manage that dose. We have to minimize the amount of bacteria that are exposed to to try and minimize their chance of becoming infected. So we do that by decreasing that dose, by managing the calves, a ca calving time, excuse me, so that they're not all aborting at the same time right all together, removing contaminated material, cleaning and disinfecting, especially if they're in an enclosed area. Uh, these are ways that we can reduce that dose and therefore decrease the likelihood that those exposed animals are going to become infected. So if you got this kind of stuff going on, you got abortions all over the place, you have a pretty good chance that a lot more of those animals are going to be infected than if you just had one, or better yet, if you had none. So we want to stop those abortions, or we want to um, separate those animals so that they're not exposed to that dose, because the more that they're exposed to, the more likely they are to get infected. So the incubation period, the time between when they're exposed and when we can detect the disease, um, is, can be very variable. It all depends on dose. It depends on the resistance of the animal. Uh, if they're vaccinated, it lengthens it. If in a, chronic in, in a chronically infected herd where there's a low level of dose out there all the time, they tend to take longer to get infected. If they're pregnant, bam, they're infected fast, and it grows really fast. But the, it, it can be two weeks, it can be two months in a heifer. The heifers can, can test negative even though they're infected up until at the time or shortly after they calve, which can be two, three, four years. Um, so it, this, is, this is one of the things that makes managing this disease complex. Those heifers are the ones that will keep those infections in there. 
So just don't ever forget that. Learn from my mistakes. And so this is really important when you're deciding testing schedules, is understanding, look at how the disease is transmitted and what can I do to intercept that transmission and stop it. And then you remove the positives and bingo, it's gone. It's not really that, not really that hard. If you just pay attention to the disease. Another thing to remember is animals that are infected, because it is intracellular, we consider permanently infected. Are there some that will clear it? Sure, there's an exception to every rule, but generally they're considered infected. It does localize, as I mentioned before, in lymph nodes and in the udder between pregnancies. So when they, they have a calf again later, they're probably infected. This is one of these gross pictures my mom doesn't like to see. This is the testis of, testis of a bull. Testes of a bull, abscesses in there. So your bulls are not big transmitters naturally, but they can become infected. They're great indicator animals. If you got a positive bull, you better look where he's been because he picked it up somewhere, and he picks it up the same way cows do, sniffing, licking, ingesting. Um, and they can become sterile. They don't all, but they can become. So clinical signs, um, talked about this some already, third trimester abortion. Especially in first calf heifers, you're going to see your abortions most likely in your first calf heifers. Um, and then after that, they may calve normally. They may not. A lot of sometimes they'll have trouble getting bred back, but they'll often have it. If you see abortion storms, uh, a whole bunch of them happening a lot, that usually, there's an exception to every rule, but that usually says that this is a newly infected herd. We've got naive animals, and you put a lot of brucella in there, man, they abort like crazy. Um, Chronically infected herds, and one of, this is one of the things that makes controlling it difficult in herds that have been a long period of time because of farmer cooperation, is they don't see this, they don't think they have a problem, and you, they think you're just a pain in the neck because you're trying to keep testing their cows and taking away the good ones, which usually means the big fat ones, and the reason they're big and fat is they're not bred. Um, so if you get rid of the disease, a lot of times their calf production will actually increase. They may not have even been aware of the subtle decrease in their calving crop because of this. So other things you'll see is retained placenta. Um, so what's the problem with us with veterinari as veterinarians with retained placentas? Yeah, what do we do? We stick our arms in there, right? Yeah, stick our arms in there and yank it out and then wonder why we got infected. All right, so retained placentas. Birth of dead or weak calves. Sometimes these calves just don't do well. And um, and so what, in, in the south, in, in the U.S., sometimes these farmers will call them ADR cows, calves. ADR calves, ain't doing right. There's just something about them, they're just not doing well. Or low milk yield, sometimes that's the only sign in a, in a, in a chronic herd especially. So you may see very subtle signs. You may see just a lowered calf crop. You may not really see anything specific if the herd's been chronically infected. One of the things that makes it difficult about this is sometimes they show no clinical signs how, at whatsoever, but they're continuing to spread brucellosis. So one of the difficulties with this then is the reaction to the farmer, but that's usually, I mean, what the blank do you mean I've got brucellosis? I'm not going to do anything. You're not going to kill my cows. They're perfectly fine, okay? So, you know, just go ahead and go home. This is a very difficult reaction because that's what happens in a chronically infected herd. They may not even realize they have it. So necropsy, unfortunately, you can't really diagnose this on necropsy alone because there's nothing specific that says, hello, I'm brucellosis. Uh, there are a lot of clinical signs, placentitis, endometritis, the abscesses in the bulls potentially, lesions in the fetus. But if you suspect it at all, be careful handling this because you can certainly get infected yourself. Um, so necropsy will actually just kind of reinforce your suspicions if you have it, but it's not something that you can rely on as being the diagnostic way to do it. 